Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded by me, Liam Miller. He, him. He is a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Love, Rinse, Repeat is recorded on the unceded sovereign lands of the Gayamago people. Today, joining me, I am very excited, is Christian Tietz. Uh, Christian is the author of Karl Barth, A Life in Conflict, which we are talking about today, the, one of the hottest books on the marketplace today out with Oxford University Press. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So for those, those who don't know, who haven't come across before, Christian is the Professor for Systematic Theology at the Institute of Hermeneutics and Philosophy of Religion at the University of Zurich. From 2008 until 2013, she was the Professor for Systematic Theology and Social Ethics at the University of Mainz. She was visiting lecturer or research scholar in Cambridge, Chicago, Heidelberg, Jerusalem, New York, and Princeton. Uh, she's a judge for the Karl Barth Prize and a member of the advisory board of the Karl Barth Foundation, Basel. So that's a bit about you. Uh, let's, let's wade into talking about this book. Uh, and I guess the biggest thing to kind of talk about, and we're almost talking a bit off mic about this, that, you know, uh, you know, when you're approaching a figure such as Bart, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to, you know, approach it all, contain it all, write it all. So I guess the question, one of the questions to start with is, you know, what was the most rewarding or, and maybe the most challenging part about trying to approach this biography of a, of a figure such as Bart? I think the most rewarding part was actually to get to know the person Karl Barth, um, because I, I could read so many letters, published and non-published letters, where you could um, mm. I could get acquaintance with his humor or with his, um, um, his how, how he would um, behave in a conflict, or that he was a brave person and aspects like that. And I really wasn't aware of that. Mm. So I and beside that, um, I got I realized that Barth is much more than the church dogmatics. Because mm. he has written so many uh, articles and, and lectures on so many topics that this really broadened my horizon on Karl Barth. The most challenging thing, though, was that there's so much literature on Barth and Barth's own write writings is like an ocean. So I was really afraid that people would, after having written a biography on Barth, would, have ex would expect of me that I would know everything on Barth. So whenever I'm giving an interview, uh, on Bart, I'm a little bit afraid that people would ask me weird questions and I would have to say, sorry, I wrote that book, but I have no idea <laughs> what he would have said on this or did he have contact with that person? Because I... it's really a uni universe of, of contacts, of history, of, yeah, and I mm. really, yeah. Oh, so oh. I, I was anxious that that <laughs> I would, would, I, would I be able to, to realize it uh, probably right. or not. I'll, I'll cut out a bunch of my questions about like, you know, what he would like for his favorite breakfast or things like that. You know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I don't just, know. I just don't to be know. safe. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, one of the questions I was thinking about, you know, which is maybe a bit broader than just like this book is this idea of what does theology gain from biography? You know, cause we have a vast amount, an ocean of, of Bart's own writings and in a lot of that, he is not including biographical detail. Um, and I guess, you know, in some ways, people might argue, look, we've, we've got the work. You just engage the work. Whoever wrote it doesn't really matter in the end. It's, it's, and does it hold up as we wrestle with it and interpret it in our own way? And really, in any way, author be damned. It's now, it's now ours to do what we want to do. And I'm not saying that writing a biography cancels that out. But I'm just curious as you're thinking about, as you, you know, think about the theology um, what do you think is gained by, by a kind of a, a, an extended reflection on the theologian? I think you really get a better um, grasp on the background of his thinking. So what is actually the historical, the concrete historical context of that article or that lecture? Why did he focus so much on that aspect and not mm. on that aspect? And I really feel that you get a better understanding of that. So if you look at, at the critical edition of Bart's works, that's what they actually do in the introductions mm. to the to the uh, articles. They explain that's the context, this was the conflict, here's the letter exchange between X and Y. And I really think that this is very important for, uh, for understanding why he focused on that or why he stressed that or why it developed from, from A to B or things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think I'm not, I'm not convinced that the life of a theologian 
justifies his theology or things like that. Hmm. I would always be with you in saying that the value of a theological system is not in, in the life of the theologian, but it's in you, the reader, who has to judge on the adequacy or uh, the value of, of that approach. So that this was not was not my aim to justify mm, mm. His, his approach. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he you have, would have to distinguish, and it's of course it's the text which we have. Mm, mm. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. I think that's a, that's a helpful um, yeah piece to have in the mix. So so moving into a bit of Bart's life, I thought we'd just kind of talk about a couple of different uh, sections of the biography, uh, starting with Bart's early career. Uh, and, and when he becomes a pastor in, in Sappenville. Um, now, you, doc you document a story that I think a lot of people might know, not, not everyone for sure, but uh, that, you know, he went into this town, which, you know, was a factory town and there was dispute over, you know, labour conditions and, and Bart kind of took the side of the factory workers in town in that dispute. And, you know, he, um, you know, you document some letters to the editor he wrote uh, or an exchange of letters between him and the son of one of the factory owners where Bart, you know, showed his characteristic ability to, to write for the throat. Um, and, and it also you can kind of talk about how this drew, draws him into his involvement of and his uh, advocating for socialism in this time. Uh, and, and one thing I think is important, you even note that kind of before coming to Sappenville, that it's his own kind of experience of poverty just before this also shapes, uh, shapes you know, this, this, this political move. So I, I guess I, I, if you could talk to us a little about this event in his life or this, this, this uh, yeah, this that happened when he came and was the pastor here, the, the red pastor. Um, and I guess how this either influenced or was shaped by, you know, his thinking of the kingdom of God and how, you know, in, in, in a kind of back and forth way. Sure. Um, as you already said, I found it really interesting that Bart, he always tells the story that because of the Sarfenwood experience, he became a rich, a rich socialist, but that's actually, actually not true because you can see when he, the first sermon in Sarfenwood already is a rich socialist mm. uh, sermon where he says the kingdom of God is realized in social justice in the society, in the family, et cetera. Um, so um, because in Geneva, where he was a vicar before, um, he already experienced what poverty mm. would do with human beings. Um, theologically, he would say that the idea of, of religious socialism is the most important idea of that time because what, what they do in religious socialism is that what Jesus uh, would have done or what Jesus actually did when he uh, lived on earth. Um, what is interesting is that Bart would say, as Christians, don't be um, too critical of political socialism because the social ideas, the ethical ideas are so important mm -hmm. that we should not, um, we should not um, shy back from socialism because they say rich is the opium of the people. <laughs> yeah, he would say the, the ethical ideas are so so important that we should not um, only be, be occupied by that pre yeah. prejudice of social of political socialism. From that uh, experience and from his um, emphasis on religious socialism, Bart thought that the kingdom of God is something which human beings should build in this world. It's not something we wait for. He once said it. Um, it's not that we should come to heaven, but that heaven should come to us. And he thought that human beings should actually realize that. But I think this um, perspective on the kingdom of God changed in the context of, the, of World War I, when Bart realized that even uh, religious socialism or socialists uh, engaged in the war. And of course, the experiment of World War I for Bart made human endeavor, be it whatever it is, even social justice, only a human endeavor. So through World War I, he felt that everything human beings do is critical or is, is problematic. And the only solution or the only salvation can only come from God and only God can bring about the kingdom of God. And then, so I guess one of the questions is, is this something you think a commitment that, that continues out through his career or, or more of a... Uh, does it kind of change as he ages? Is this more of like a, the youth, the young Bart who then, uh, you know, 
matures out of this or do you think it's still there even as the kind of I guess the form of the work changes? From my observation I'd say that he remained a socialist or a social democrat throughout his life but he strongly distinguished this political conviction from his theological convictions. So mm. I, I think later he would not have said that um, you have to be a socialist if you want to be a Christian. Yeah okay so uh, later in the book, you come to, uh, it's in, in chapter nine, um, a, a troubled menage a trois, uh, and, and you write about Bart's relationship with uh, Charlotte von uh, Kirschbaum, uh, detailing their relationship, um, the tensions between Carl and her and Nellie, uh, Nellie Bart, the, the various um, pulls and pushes that led to all three under under one roof. Now, I guess much of the the correspondence and, and documentation you're drawing upon in this chapter is still, you know, relatively new. Um, you know, was it was published much late, uh, much after Bart's death. Um, what responsibility, I guess, did you think about, you know, approaching this this chapter? You know, you know, especially knowing that it was going to be, you know, for the first time, really laid out in a way for a lot of folks who have engaged Bart's work. If you know, not that we. He, it's been you know known about it but not engaged in such a uh, detailed way um you know you know as you're trying to hold that this is a biography of Bart but right in this moment you're really in the midst of the intimacies of the lives of three people um you know where where, where Bart is maybe not the one who's the most um impacted yeah, in a way yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, f I found it actually difficult to read through those letters and I very often felt, am I actually allowed to read that? Um, they were not meant to be published. Um, Bart actually decided that letters between him and his wife should not be uh, published at all. Um, and what helped me was then the, the um, decision of the children, the argument why the, ch the children actually decided that these letters should be published. And they wrote a statement why they wanted that because they wanted to end the rumor about that triangle. And they wanted that people really knew how, what role Charlotte von Kirschbaum played in Bart's life and how this uh, affected the marriage between Bart and Ellie. So that somehow I felt, I shouldn't say entitled, but allowed to, to read through those letters. Um, when I read them, I nevertheless um, tried to not judge them but just to listen to their situation. It's very complex from my observation. You cannot simply say, here's the problem or there's the problem. There are many, many problems in the whole issue. And therefore I myself try to not, um, yeah, to not, to not judge at all, but just to present the material to the reader. Um, and I guess, you know, thinking about the, did it for you does it change anything with the way you think about the the work that came in that period or after that period at all like particularly thinking about you know reading more you know uh charles role in the work as well does it or, or that this is happening alongside while bart's developing you know the later dogmatics and that does, um does that get changed to you as you, you know the more you kind of as we've said like you know thinking about the concrete things that are happening in the life as a way of shaping the work not necessarily validating or invalidating but shaping how we receive it um do you feel it it, it, it does that as you as you now return to Bart's theology or um or is it kind of a just more more distinct still for you know, in a way I think it made me more sensitive to to listen to aspects of Bart theology where he stresses craze so much for me, this speaking of craze has now a, if you may say, personal subtone, um, because there are some letters which he wrote to friends where he, uh, to clo close friends, knew about the relationship, and um, in those letters, Bart really expresses his awareness of his own guilt, and it shows that he is aware of the complexity of life, or the, the um, that there are experiences which you cannot. Uh, grasp within a theological system. So for me, it made me consider him more nuanced than I thought he was. And, and one thing I would like to add is that when Bart speaks of craze, it's not cheap craze, it's always craze that identifies guilt. And that's something which I really find aware in his thinking. If I may quote a letter which he wrote to a friend in 1947, 
In this letter, he summarized how he viewed himself in his relationship to the two women and what this meant for his theology. And now I quote Bart, the very fact that is the greatest earthly blessing bestowed upon me in my life is simultaneously the harshest judgment against my earthly life. So I stand before God's eyes without being able to escape God in one way or another. It's entirely possible that because of this, there is an element of experience in my theology or better put, an element of lived life. In a very concrete manner, I've been forbidden from becoming the legalist that under other circumstances I could have become. Mm. So, and I think I really understood that grace is not only a, one motive in his theology beside other motives, but I think from that background, he really could, uh, could even understand people's longing for grace or dependence on grace and aspects of that. So. Thank you. So I, I was curious to ask about the church dogmatics, and, you know, because you, you titled that, that, that chapter called like the white whale. Uh, and I'm interested a bit about Bart's kind of, I guess, feelings toward the church, dramatic, church dogmatics at the, toward the end of his days. Um, and I guess perhaps relatedly, and you can take these separately, or perhaps they dovetail, um, how he, how you think he might have felt about the, I guess the, I think I said when I was sending you the, uh, the questions, the, the modest publishing industry that the Church Dogmatic sustains to this day. Um, yeah, how, how, you know, how he felt about the project and how he feels maybe folks have engaged it and engage it still to this day. Mm. I think it's a mixture of aspects. On the one hand, I think he, during his last years, really tried to finish the church dogmatics and often sent letters to people, I cannot come, I have to finish my church dogmatics. But then the older he got and when Charlotte von Kirschborn became sick and could not support his work on the church dogmatics anymore, then he um, re realized that he would not be able to finish it. People still said, you should finish your eschatology. And he said, no, I'm sorry. Um, Somebody else should, should finish my eschatology. I'm not able to do that. Um, at the same time, I think when you read, or I, I observe when you read Bart's letters, when he was a very old man, he's often even depressed, you might want to say, about the theological situation at his time. He, did, he wasn't very convinced by newer theological developments, by new hermeneutic theology. Um, and he felt that he has written so many pages in his church dogmatics to um, promote a good theology and uh, the theology he was convinced of, but he wasn't able through the 12 volumes he had written to support that theology. Why should he write a 13th volume? So it was some kind of a, um, res to say resignation? Yeah, resignation that, that he felt, okay, I tried my best, but actually I couldn't uh, do it. Um, then you asked me about this, uh, would he like the, um, the industry on the church dogmatics? I think one aspect of his personality would like that. I think he really enjoyed being so famous and having so many people discussing his theology or visiting him and asking him what he would think about that or that theological or church problem. But at the same time, I had the feeling that um, he remained um, modest and and um, and um, humble in terms of his own theology. There's a very nice anecdote about his 18th, uh, 18th sorry, birthday where he got uh, letters from all around the world and a festschrift and people celebrated him and so on. And at the end of that celebration, he he stood up and um, sen then said that people should not call him the greatest theologian of, of the 20th century. But it might well be the case that perhaps there is a little man or woman who has been holding Bible studies somewhere very quietly, who has been in reality the greatest theologian of the century. This sounds a little bit romantic, but actually in that moment, Bart took out, out his copy of the second Romans and showed the people who were present the dedication, which would, he had given that book to himself in 1922. He had written into the book, Karl Barth, to his dear Karl Barth, 1922. And he had added a quote from Luther, from Luther and written that into his book, which says, if you however feel and let yourself think that you with your own little books, teachings or writings have done so exquisitely and preached splendidly. And if you also very much like it when someone praises you to another 
and want to be praised, then grab yourself by the ears. And if you are grabbing correctly, you will find a lovely pair of big, long, rough donkey ears. And from my experience of Bart, I feel that's not only, he not only made that up, it somehow represents his feeling that, yes, he liked that, that, that he was honored so much, but at the same time, he remained, remained uh, yeah, humble and, and felt that it was actually, if I may phrase it pious, that it was actually God who used him, but not only his, not his, his own capacity. Thank you for that. So we have a, a, an occasional segment on this show called In the Room, uh, which I, I sometimes ask authors who spent a prolonged time uh, with a particular thinker. Uh, and as you say, you got to know Bart a little bit uh, in, this, in this project. So, so the, the, there's two scenarios that are before you. You can answer both or, or one. Um, what topic would you just like to sit in the audience and, and, and listen to Bart speak on? If you could just be like, okay, I'm just gonna be sitting in the back row and just get to listen to him go on and on as long as he wants to. This is what I'd like that topic to be. And the other one is what topic would you like to sit down across the table from him and, and argue about and try to convince him of, of, of this or that, or at least just try to get, really get the nitty ditty of his details on a, on a particular topic. I would like to listen uh, to him lecturing on the ap Apocatastasis Panton on the universal, um, how to say, reconciliation, mm. because he once said, I do not teach it, but I do not not teach it. And I would <laughs> like to listen to him not teaching, not not not, not teaching <laughs> that doctrine. So yeah. that would really interest me. Mm. And if I would sit in front of him at a table, I would really ask him, why were you so rude um, and and um, not too self-critical when you had a conflict with, with a person? I, I very often felt that he, he was very aggressive and very confident that he is on the right side and the other is wrong, even in personal letters. And I really would like to better understand that or even criticize him that he would, might have been sometimes too, if you think of the conflict with which he had with Brunner and which really Brunner uh, hurt a lot. Um, I would like to ask him that. Why, why mm. did he behave that way? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good one. So folks, this has been a very brief look at a very rich book and and i really want to encourage folks to check it out if you're all interested in bart uh if you all want to know about you know this figure behind you know, so much of the influential work of, of 20th century theology um then then do check out carl bart a life in conflict out now with oxford university press um it, it, really wonderfully readable and 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 vast in its in the, and and deep and what it covers and and it is i think really does um help shape you know the next time you pick up a particular work of bart and think about what was happening at this time uh, is is going to be of great benefit um christian is it is there anything else you want to draw people's attention to anything you want to foreshadow that you're working on next any other things you want to promote or plug uh at this moment I would like to write another biography and I would, I'm open for ideas. So if okay. somebody would say that's a person, I'd, I'd really Folks. love to do that again. Folks, <laughs> here's your chance for your favorite. Um, <laughs> and I know my listeners have their favorites. Um, we, have, we have a decent Schleiermarker contingent in the audience. Uh, so, you know, that could be an interesting one, you know, to contrast with Bart. Um, but yeah, well, there you go. That's, that's great. Well, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, today. Yeah. Thank you for this interview. Thank you for the book. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll talk again someday. Thank you.